um, that would go to the Smithsonian. That might be beneficial if you probably touched on it already. Mm -hmm. This is the National Naval Officers Association. Okay. I, I don't know if you're familiar with that group. Mm -mm. Back in 1972, a group of uh, black naval officers formed a, a, an association to assist the Navy with uh, recruiting and retaining black officers. And so they're on the web, and you can, you can find them and get contact with the national president, yeah. and I'm sure that they would be very cool. Yeah, I definitely wrote that down when I was talking to you yesterday. I know I did. So, so here's what's going to happen. I'm going to start off okay. the interview, uh, introduce us, and then um, Robert's going to give all of the, ask all the questions. Okay. As you, you can talk into the camera, you okay. can look at him, or you can look at me. Okay. Um, if. I can take that if if you say something that I need more information on the on the video, either I'll ask or I'll you'll see me pass a note yeah. to Robert saying ask this no, question. Probably. So don't just ignore no. me doing that. But that's just no, me no. trying to get some more information on the on the on the tape. Uh, but otherwise, we're just going to let it run and and let you do what you do best. Tell us what you know. We're the students, both of us. So I'm going to get us going. No, wait a minute. Mm -hmm. Do I look all right? I got I Perfect. Have, Fine, good. Jigs, jigs here go off the top of my head. Good, good, good. 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 Just a second. Um. Does it look all right? No, it's not. Let's move it in a little bit. Where are you? Uh, my position? There we go. You're good. Uh, you're good. The flag was in with it. Was in with it. Let's see. Good evening. Good evening. My name is Dr. Rashanice Candy Tate. I'm with the Association for African American Life and History, the ASALA, the Atlanta Organizing Branch, and I'm here with Robert Pinnell of Atlanta Metropolitan State College and a member of ASALA. <laughs> and we're here um, conducting a Veterans History Project on Thursday. No, this is Friday evening. June 26, 2015, and we're in Dunwoody, Georgia, at the family reunion of, um, Foster of the Foster Hendersons. Right. Take it away, Robert. Well, thank you for taking the time out of your day to come and spend this time with this retired veteran. Present. I appreciate uh, your, your time and your interest. Well, we know you're, we want to honor you with capturing your story. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you for your service. You know, before we start, I just wanted to say thank you for your service. Speak up a little bit for me. Oh, okay. Uh, so we'll start with uh, where and when were you born? I was born in Washington, D.C., September 25th, 1938. Uh, who were your parents and what were their occupations? My father was Walton C. Bobo Sr. My mother was Annie Mabel Jones. And my father was a chef cook for Marriott. The name of the hotel where they have in the Washington D.C. area. And your wife was? She was. She worked occasionally in, in the, uh, with the department stores and stuff like that. Uh, was there anyone um, in your family that served in the military? Yes, I had uh, uncles that served briefly during World War II, and uh, and I had one that served and uh, just passed. Served in. Uh, in, uh, in Germany, in Southern not Germany, but Belgium. And he was over there with uh, Patton and the Battle of the Bulls and that sort of thing. Probably with the Red Ball Express. So there was a good connection there. Um, who were your siblings? What were their names? I had uh, three brothers. Uh, my oldest brother was Dennis, Dennis Bobo, Bedney Bobo, who's passed. And my youngest brother, who's here with me today, Emmanuel Bobo, so there were four of us. And where were you in the... I was the oldest. You were the oldest. I was the oldest. Uh, what were you doing before this? Before you entered the service? I was in, in the college at Howard University in engineering school. And uh, I wasn't the best prepared student when I started school. So after some uh, flailing around, Howard says, uh, uh, you need to sit out a semester. And so I did. And at that time, the uh, Army Draft Board called me up and said, Mr. Bobo, I want to congratulate you on doing well on your pre-induction examinations. And I thought I'd give you a call in December before we drafted in January. 
and that's what made me decide we need to take control of this myself. So, uh, so how did you take control? I took control by enlisting in the submarine reserve. Now the submarine reserve said you can enlist now, and you have you don't have to go on active duty to next year. Well, at that point in my life, I wasn't anxious to go on active duty at all. So going next year has got to be a lot better than going this year. So that's what got me started. And that's, uh, but once I did that, I saw doors of opportunity open up that I never knew existed. And I said, why didn't I have some teachers tell me about this? Uh, if you don't mind me backtracking to the last question a little bit, how did you actually feel about being drafted? I didn't have any animosity towards it. It just wasn't something that I had planned to do. I would, I would have not... Uh, revolted or fought against it. Uh, if I had to go, I had to go, but it was just not, uh, it was not the number one thing on my list, if you, if you put, want to put it that way. And, uh, I, and I want to ask a backup question. Uh, get it going to Howard. What, yes. what made you decide on Howard? Well, or, and, you or, or some, going to college? You asked some interest. I had not planned to go to college. And I had to secure the job at the Washington Naval Yard as an air conditioner, refrigeration mechanic apprentice. My father, who came from the cotton fields of South Carolina, took me out in the front yard and said, son, I didn't have an opportunity to go to school. I wish you would. I don't have any money. But I got a roof over your head. I got food on the table. And I'll get you a job. I got you a weekend job working at Marriott. So in respect for my father, I went up to Howard and said, I would want to go to college. And they said, no problem, Mr. Bobo. What would you like to major in? Well, I said, well, what are the choices? And they, I said, well, let's just cut through the chase here. Where, who makes the money when they get out of, out of school? He said, well, the engineers do quite well. I said, good, I want to be one of those. So they, and they said, what kind would you like to be? I said, what are the choices? And he said, electrical, well, mechanical, and civil, but I didn't like getting my hands dirty with grease or digging in the dirt. And he said, as architecture, my handwriting is trouble, so let's do electrical engineering. So that's where I ended up. It's kind of crazy, isn't it? <laughs> um, do you know anyone else that was drafted? I don't know anybody that was drafted. I, I, really, I don't know anybody that was, that was drafted. I don't, I don't know anybody that was drafted. When did you, when did you go to training camp? I, I didn't have, as, as an officer, you don't have training camp. You have what we call, I went to what we call officer candidate school, where they taught navigation, engineering, uh, uh, ship handling, uh, fire control, command and control, all of those skills that you need to be commanding officer of a naval ship. Um, was there, I guess, any jealousy towards, you know, with you being uh, a college student, so that's how you actually got into officer training, so, uh, you know, as, uh, so early, was there any jealousy, I guess? By anyone so else? Then I, I, I didn't understand the question. Uh, I probably should have worded that uh, differently. Was there any jealousy toward uh, toward you from anyone for the fact that you uh, you know came in as an officer? No, there was no jealousy at all. There was, uh, uh, in fact, uh, the people who, in my family they were very very proud that I that I did, did this stuff. The people who were my subordinates were also proud to see me, and they they, they covered. It, they washed out for me. Because you were was, one of a few or one, one of African Americans? One of a few, yeah. yeah but the, uh, I, didn't, I didn't hear it personally, but it was said that I was the first African American that ever served on the first ship I went to. Mm -hmm. And somebody said, What are we going to do? We have a black officer coming. And the commanding officer responded, You're going to do your job. And what year was this? This was 1964. Uh, so when did you actually um, uh, enter your duty? Like when specifically? I entered uh, duty on April 17th, 19th, uh, at, oh, that's when I was commissioned, April 17th, 1964. I was an ensign, all one if you will. Um, where did you go? I went to a ship in New London, Connecticut called the USS Fulton. It was a submarine tender. I was a communication officer. I had responsibility for somewhere between 30 and 50 people and uh, and a whole host of technology. Uh, what was your experience like um, just getting you know, um, adapting? 
I didn't. I didn't have any problem adapting. Uh, I was pretty self-confident. The uh, I went to a segregated elementary school, a segregated uh, uh, junior high school, a segregated high school. But the quality of the education we got was outstanding. Uh, we had, say for example, in elementary school, first grade on, we changed classes and ran our own class schedule, just like they did in high school. So we came into junior high school with a high level of confidence and competence. Uh, did you really, did you receive any specialized training? Uh, training in communications and. Uh, uh, if you want to call it grad school specialized training, the Navy sent me to Monterey, California to uh, earn my master's degree there. Uh, training courses in financial management, managerial accounting, leadership, uh, it's called anything that a, an, a senior executive would need in, the, in a corporation, you also need to be at that level in the military. So the U.S. Navy paid for you to get your master's degree? Yes, they paid for me to get my master's degree. They paid my way out to, uh, from Virginia to California. They paid for my house. They paid for my books, my pencils, erasers, and gave me a check every month. Uh, can you explain what officer training was like? Officer training was uh, kind of interesting because I, I'm coming from Howard University. And I found out that the guys from Harvard and Yale didn't have a thing on them. I found that I could compete in the real world. And, and you loved it, and you said, bring it on. Um, was there any, was there any difficulty adapting anywhere in your military life, maybe socially or with the food, with the interactions, anything? I guess I, I never had any difficulty. We had some very interesting experiences on based upon background. I recall once we had grits for breakfast in the water room. If you're from the south, you know what grits are. And so the st steward brought out my grits, and I said, great, this is fantastic. I said, and I got some bacon. I said, see this bacon here? Go back in the, in the galley and bring me some of the grease that you threw out from the, that came off of this bacon. And she said, I'm sorry, sir. We threw that away. So well, look, next time you serve those grits, save me some of the grease <laughs> so I can make some red eye gravy. <laughs> Some real grits. <laughs> but uh, no, that was, uh, I, I, I've always felt comfortable around people. And uh, I guess one of the things that uh, I learned in high school, if I'm in a situation, I expect to be in charge. That was Navy and not Navy. And I brought that with me so I didn't have, I wasn't intimidated or anything like that at all. Uh, what were your instructors like, if you can remember any of them? In, College or, 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 or uh, an officer training? They were all competent. Uh, they were, I don't remember the names of them. They weren't that memorable. But, uh, they all did what they had to do. They gave me the information and I passed the test. No one was uh, hard on you? or I had to work, but some of it was new. Some of it was new, and, uh, but you, coming, you had the background. Like, for instance, uh, when you're maneuvering at sea, you actually do vectors. and. Uh, and I never did graphic vectors, but I did mathematical vectors. So it didn't take much to, to make the transition. So we had a saying at Howard, you burn the midnight oil. And I had a lamp and I burned the midnight oil and did what I had to do. Um, where did you serve? Like, how many, what are the places that you served? Let's see. I started with the ships. I served on the USS Henshaw. No, excuse me, the first one, the USS Fulton. USS the cruise of Boston, the USS Springfield very briefly, uh, the USS uh, uh, Inchon, uh, then uh, the Nimitz Kennedy, just about every active duty carrier that was in the East Coast inventory at that time. Uh, that was the ships. Were there any specific port cities? You know, that you stayed in, or I was stationed. Home ported in Italy for about two and a half years, but uh, we visited uh, we visited just about every place that the ocean bumped up against. Uh, uh, I can't I can't remember them all, but I do recall one year out of the thirty, we left Norfolk, Virginia, 
went to Wildenshafen, Germany, Oslo, Norway, Bergen, Norway, came back to Norfolk, Virginia. Uh, we got there, we got a message where they said, leave port immediately and head west. We didn't know where we were going. And we got out in the ocean, so we said, go through the Panama Canal. We went through the Panama Canal, said, keep going west and stop at Hawaii. We got, then keep going and go to Guam. The next thing we know, we were in Vietnam, uh, clearing out the mines in Hong Kong Harbor. And we finished that, came back by, by way of Mozambique. And on that one, in that one year, we circumnavigated the globe. I could not have paid for a trip like that. I couldn't afford. <laughs> Were you, um, was there, was the, was the Vietnam War going on at the time when you actually traveled to yes. Vietnam? Yes. Well, we had two occasions. The Inchon, we cleared the mines out of High Park Harbor. The uh, Boston, we were actually doing gunfire support. And so we were stationed off the coast about 20 miles. And those long, those big guns would fire with pinpoint accuracy uh, that far in. So if the soldiers needed, the soldiers on the ground needed some help, we would fire those guns and everybody would gain, we were well respected. Um, what was your, what was going through your mind as you, um, as you supported fire? You know, my job, my job was to make sure that uh, that people could talk to each other, they could move the information back and forth. Uh, that was uh, one of my primary jobs. I also had duties with maneuvering the ship. We didn't want to crash into anybody, anything like that. So I had those kinds of officers, the deck duties, as well as uh, department head duties. Uh, so I was department head very early on. So, what was the the air you, you as an African American officer having to direct all of this uh, in the ship? Were there t tense moments or? It, no, there were no tense moments. There were no tense moments with me. They had may have had some behind my back. But they were, they were, there were none that they were bold enough to bring to my attention, because I would, I would deal with them. And for example, uh, we had one of the ships transport was the LPH. We carried Marines, and they flew in by helicopter. And the commanding officer says, anybody has a fight on my ship, they will spend some time in what he called the crossbar hotel. It was the brig. And so two Marines, a Marine and a sailor got into a fight. One was, the sailor was black, the Marine Corps guy was white. And so the Marine commanding officer, separate chain of command, said, look, we all got to live on this ship together, be nice. And so the, command, the commanding officer, the Navy guy, was prepared to put him in the brig. So about 11 o'clock that night, I knocked on his door and said, Captain, that's something I want to talk to you about. And so his response was, you don't tell me how to run my non-judicial punishment. He said, I'm not telling you anything. This is some information you might want to know before you do it. Then he calmed down. And he, then the next thing I heard, he called the uh, common, uh, the, the Marine Corps commanding officer up to his place. said, look, the next time something involves both of our people, we need to talk before anything is done. That, that wasn't a tense moment, but sometimes you, you do need to speak up when it's time to, time to speak up. I always felt there's no point in having authority if you don't use it. Now, for, for those of us look, looking at the video and not knowing what the brig is or what it looks like or what it kind of help us. The brig is, a, think of a very, a very small cell. A jail cell would be considered big compared to the brig. That's so, not a place you want to go. So serious solitary confinement. Yeah, yeah they, they bring you bread and water. <laughs> No, that's not that's not that's not that's not a that's not a vacation spot. Um, aside from that um, that confrontation between the two branches, were there any um, how was interaction between all the branches of military when you needed to get operations done or get things done? Well, you got pride and service pride in, in, in every group. And I, my group is a group of communicators. Uh, and the Marines had their own communicators and of course my guys said we're the best, and their guys said we're the best. So I talked to the uh, commandant of the Marines and said, look, uh, let's do this. Let's integrate our groups. I will send my people ashore with you, and your people can operate on the ship with me. And so now we have a greater appreciation for what we do. It worked out great. Um, I know that you said you were the only, you were the first black officer on your, uh, 
on a ship. But do you feel like you were, um, do you feel like African Americans were represented well during that time? We were not represented numerically as much as we should be. And and that's why the National Naval Officers was, was, was assigned to assist the Navy with recruiting and retaining black officers. In fact, until early 1970s, 71, 72, something like that, there were no naval ROTC units on the start of black campuses. And then they were established at Southern Florida A&M, Savannah State, North Carolina Central, uh, North Carolina a and they had a list of them there. But until that time, there were none. And so that's just, that is a major source of officers and, and for the Army and Air Force, it's a major source of black officers. We had none. What, um, what exactly was the National Naval Officers Union? The, the association was a group of black folks and who were, and it, it was fully integrated also, uh, a group. It was not, there were no restrictions about your race on being, being involved. But the mission was to assist the Navy with recruiting and, and retention. We weren't, we weren't confronting, we weren't challenging. This is what we say we want to do, we're going to help you out. You're going to you go. talk a little bit more about Vietnam. Yeah. Um, what was your most memorable uh, experience in Vietnam? I guess uh, it, it wasn't very ex oh, yeah. Well, as a communicator, it, uh, you, you, you try to push the envelope. This was before satellites and all of this. And so we're talking about high frequency communication. And so we leave Vietnam and we maintain communications, continuous communications with uh, stations around the world. That meant that you had to do three hops, that is, it had to bounce off the atmosphere three times and still arrive in an intelligible form at, at its destination. That required, that was a challenge. But we pulled into Boston Harbor, still terminated, connected with a uh, station that was, uh, I forget where it was, it was either Alaska or it was a long ways away. But that was, uh, professionally, that was that was a challenge. That had never been done before. Um, have you ever heard of Project 100,000? Not until you mentioned it. Oh, guys, you got to. Uh, essentially, Project 100,000 was a government-funded program that actually, um, it was um, advertising people to get enlisted into the military. Um, they were looking for 100,000 people to actually fight in the Vietnam War to, and they offered them specialized training in certain things would actually give them uh, more benefits uh, when it came time for them to go back into civilian life. Mm -hmm. But what actually happened was about 350,000 people came in, so it was more than they you know, expected. Um, a lot of people didn't receive training. 40% of those people were African American, and 41% of those African Americans went to the front lines of Vietnam. Mm -hmm. How do you feel about that? I didn't know about that until you mentioned it. But, and, I, and I want to back up to one of the, you asked me about my duty station. I left out the most significant duty station I had. That was personal to me. It was at the commanding officer of the Naval ROTC unit at Southern University. And it was my job to go out and, 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 and encourage, I don't say recruit, but encourage young people to, hey, this is a, this is something that's, that's in the long run is good for you. Not, from, not necessarily from a war fighting point of view, but from a personal development point of view. As, a, as an officer, you get a series of challenging jobs. Every two years, you're forced into a job that's over your head. You grow up to it, guess what you get? Another job that's over your head. And you keep doing that. And through that forced growth, growth process, if you decide to retire or, 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 or terminate your service early, you are fully prepared to step into corporate America. You, you can't buy that. Uh, you can't get that experience that quickly anywhere else, I think. And so going out to the, uh, and so I would tell young people, no, you don't have to enlist in order to become an officer. You can go to school right now and we'll pay your tuition. 
your books, your university fees, your out-of-state fees, your lab fees, and give you a stipend every month. Uh, were you enlisted, or you had you already finished your master's program by then? No, I enlisted as I started off as an E1, as I told you in the submarine reserve, and I made I made it all the way up to E3, and that's the seaman, that's a seaman, and so from, from that point on, I went to Austin Candidate School, and uh, I was on a totally different track. Uh, did you ever, uh, when you were encouraging? Uh, students at Southern University, did you ever, uh, I guess, kind of tell them your story about, you know, what, what can actually, you know, be possible, you know, once with the college degree, I mean, with college education getting in? By all means, we got the question, we have a freshman assembly, and they said, well, Captain, I said, how come you join the Navy? I said, uh, I said, you want to know the truth or you want me to give you a, a nice answer? Because you know they say, we want to know the truth. And as I told you earlier, I was dodging the draft. I had no idea of the, of the opportunities that were there. I had no idea. Um, how did you stay? What, what year was this at Southern? What, what was it? Southern, where you were doing the ROTC? I was the commanding officer. I was, a, I was a, the command, CO, commanding mm -hmm. officer, that sort of thing. I, there was nobody in charge of me. Mm -hmm. I say what year? Oh, 75 through 78, something like that. Um, how did you stay in touch with family and friends back home? I wrote my wife a letter and I called every once in a great while and uh, I visited when I could. Before you move on, I, I still want to flush out a little bit more about, about Vietnam. Okay. Because um, you said you mentioned one incident, but you said there were two. So uh, the, the experiences were totally different. I went over on the Boston twice. Both of those were gunfire support missions and we, uh, and we had uh, plans for doing that. And uh, and so as the officer of the deck, you executed the plans. It was uh, it was almost it was uh, I think on one occasion somebody fired back at us, and so we couldn't put that to rest. Because we had what we call suppression fire, and uh, it was basically uh, for us on on board the ship. It was uh, people they would come out. To, the soldiers would come out to the ship for rest and re relaxation. That was. Uh, it was not kind of the hardships that you might visualize that a, a soldier in the field in the didn't ground. have those. We had dinner with linen tablecloths and the, every day in the steward service, and, uh, and we would go to battle stations with a coat and tie. As it was it, the Navy experience as a naval officer, you just can't imagine what the difference is between that, say, and a combat officer in the, in the field, mm -hmm. marine, all, uh -uh. and that they're all. And they both do. Everybody does their job, but it's just a totally different, totally different experience. Don't you have any more Vietnam questions? Um. And my uh, my whole thing was uh, pushing the envelope as far as communication was concerned. I, my my thought was doing more of it and better than anybody else. For example, we were not a flagship. A flagship was equipped to carry an admiral. We were not that, but having been around the block once or twice here in Norfolk, Virginia, my guys went out and found some additional communication ship on, on ships that had been put out of commission, brought it to my ship, installed it. And so we left Vietnam not, not officially being equipped as a flagship, but I had more capability than they did. Um. Can you describe your two and a half years in Italy? Actually, well, uh, when when were those? Uh, when was your time in Italy? Like, what year was that? Oh, I was uh, in Italy. Ooh, I guess from late early mid early seventies, seventy. Uh, some was born seventy four, probably seventy six to seventy six, seventy five, seventy six, something like that. Okay. And in that position, I was a communication officer on the, uh, what we call the Commander Task Force 60 staff. The Task Force 60 consisted of all of the surface ships in the, uh, in, in the Mediterranean. And as such, I was responsible for communicate for all of that communication. And so uh, we would put together, uh, at, at that time, we were, now satellites are coming into the business. And so now we're, we're integrating 
satellites and high frequency radio and US HF radio. Uh, we were stretching the envelope as far as uh, command and control, bringing the commander, the decision maker, a composite picture of air, surface, subsurface, all in one, all in one place, and intelligence all in one place. And so we were scratching the surface for what you see now when you look at the situation rooms and stuff like that. Um, and, and we would, my whole thing was push the envelope. I always like to do things the way everybody else ain't doing. Uh, let's do something different. Let's be innovative. Let's take it to where nobody thinks we can go. That's, that's been sort of me. Uh, what was your favorite shit? At the moment, they were all my favorite. <laughs> but uh, I don't know. I, I guess uh, I started to re recognize uh, on my first ship, I caught holy Lord knows what. I, uh, th I didn't know what I was supposed to be doing. I think I had a boss that was uh, bound and determined to get me booted out of the Navy by giving me these impossible jobs. I didn't know any better, so I did them. And then, uh, and so as a result of going through that experience, when I went to my second ship, I was still a junior officer, but my performance level was much higher than the junior officer, the other people of my rank. And so normally the uh, commanding officer of the uh, ship at that level doesn't really interview the junior officers, but he saw my report and called me up to Mr. Bobo, I had to see who you were. I didn't understand the significance. It was no big deal to me then. I didn't understand it. It was uh, 10 years later. I was uh, in the Mediterranean, I believe. And I was a senior communicator in a whole flotilla of ships. And the Commodore was the guy who was, uh, he, he was in charge of that flotilla. So we got a, phone, a call on the phone, the red phone, if you will. He said, go get your so-and-so over here. I turned around and said, Captain, can I use your boat? He said, by all means. So I took his boat and we went around town, had lunch and dinner and a few libations along the way. At about two o'clock in the morning, he said, Bo, you remember this incident? Your boss was bound in the term. And that sort of hit me like a ton of bricks. I had no clue what had happened to me until 10 years afterwards. And that's when I saw that that experience, that adverse experience, really molded me and shaped me, enabled me to uh, to do whatever, whatever little bit I did. You know, to be a moment in general. You know, be a moment in general. Yes, in general. Um, did you? Uh, what were your experiences like when you docked uh, at certain ports? Uh, no problem. I, I, I went anywhere I wanted to go. Did what I needed to do. People were most gracious. Uh, I had no problems with anybody anywhere. I guess if uh, if there was only one experience that I had that. You might want to determine it. I don't. I don't know if it was adverse or it was uh, uh, spiritual. But uh, sailor, I was in charge of the ship that night, and the sailor called me the N word. I didn't touch him. I don't know what happened to him, but somehow or another he fell in the water off the pier. And so I said, "Told the N, please get that man out of the water, put him in the brig." And I, that's only, only, uh, only docking and that was. He was drunk, he didn't, uh, but that was that was not that was not a big deal. But in dealing with civilians and just going out, is there, no, was, every, there was there every, one place that you particularly everybody liked? everybody I I have had not one adverse experience with a civilian in any country. I I uh, Pensacola, Florida, not Pensacola, but uh, it was Florida. I went to Florida. Yeah, I think it may have been. I wasn't Pensacola. I went to Florida and I, my shoes, my white shoes had worn out and the tops were separated from the bottom. So I, I had rented the car so I could get around. And uh, my first stop was at the shoe shop to get my, get my shoes repaired. And the white shoe repairman said, I tried to pay him, he wouldn't take my money. That was how nice it was. Because you were a Navy officer. Yeah, he, he, I had my white uniform on and he, and he respected it. I, I have had, had no experience, you know, in Charleston, South Carolina. I went down there temporarily with my wife and I rented a temporary apartment with no problem whatsoever. So, you know, the thing that I expected to be 
uh, bad experiences were not. And so with um, Vietnam and you know, so that's you know civil rights movement going on. They're protesting the war. What, what were your what were you hearing and what, how did you feel we about did, it? We didn't hear nearly as much as uh, uh, as. The amount of information, looking back on it, the amount of information that I had was limited. I was there and participated in the March on Washington, but that was for, before I went on active duty. Um, I just, it was, you were a part of it, but you, you were over there somewhere. I, I said, I spent a good portion of my life being gone. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and we, and we did, our, we tried to do our part by, encouraging and promoting civil rights where we were, is where I was. Did you, um... But I went, before you move on, you just say, oh, I participated, I was there at the March on Washington. Tell us that story. How did, how did you get there? What, what? Well, I was in my hometown. I, I couldn't, I couldn't, I couldn't. Well, there, there, there are people who are not active, even if it comes up to their front doors. So uh, you must have, what, what, what uh, pricked I, you to make you want to be involved? I, my... I, my, as I mentioned earlier, my father was cotton, the son of a cotton farmer in, uh, in, in South Carolina. And every summer, I would go down to Spartanburg, South Carolina, a little in, in the South Carolina, a little place within Spartanburg. And I, from Washington, D.C., I would be barefooted, uh, bib overhauls with no underwear on, no shirt and a straw hat. I was a country boy. And I saw all of the uh, uh, Jim Crow, the segregation, the, uh, the position that uh, black folks were placed in. I knew what, uh, uh, you know, the theaters would, uh, he had to go to, uh, on the second floor. Uh, I saw all of that. And, uh, and, and through all of that, I saw an independence in my, in my grandfather. I don't know what kind of education he had, if he had any. What was his name? His name was Bedney Bo. And at that time, not a sharecropper like we hear about, it, but he was an independent farmer, owned a hundred acres of land, and uh, it was like living at the home of plenty. He had, he sold his crops, but he could not, he did chose not to bank it. If he had banked his money, he would have called attention to himself. So there's probably a fortune bird out there in Mason Jars right there. <laughs> but you see that kind of independence, and in spite of all the adversities, and he says, I didn't know the country was in a depression until 15 years after it was over. And so that, that, that kind of independence rubbed off on me. And all through high school and college, I looked forward to going down to the country where there was no running water. So you had to, in fact, a well was an upgrade. We went, had to go down to the spring. And so that, and so that was, that has been my foundation, a, a whole host of, uncles and aunts, uh, and, and I didn't understand what they were telling me then. I recall one uncle says, if you're going to go someplace, the first thing you got to do is get up. And how many people do you know who said, I'm going to go, I'm going to go, and 10 years later they're still sitting there telling me what they're going to do. Those kinds of things made, they meant a lot to me. And then, so getting back to, so that's why, how did you get involved in the... Well, I, I, I guess I had no choice. Okay. I had no choice. It was not a matter of, of deciding not to. I, I was working at the time, I was working, working my way through school. I told my boss, I won't be there. You still had your job when you came I, I, It didn't matter. Okay. <laughs> it was, wasn't a question, it didn't matter. Okay. So, um, so with that, uh, since you were in the service um, during Martin Luther King's assassination in 1968, was there any um, reaction? Have you, did you hear of any of the uh, the riots that were going on? I heard of them, but I was I was here again. I was I think I was to see some, but I, I didn't. There was no experience on that, and uh, we had uh, it was no, there was no experience in that at all. I, I I saw the news. I saw the news, but. Uh, I, I, I don't know of anybody who's, I don't personally know of anybody who's involved. I had three brothers in Washington. They weren't involved in those kinds of things. Kind of, my father wouldn't stand for it. What about um, on the military basis? Did you uh, hear of any of those? I, 
I served in a military base, the Norfolk Naval Base, and here again, I was the, uh, I was in charge. I was in charge of uh, uh, communications around the world. We had what we ran, what we call the Communication Area Master Station, and all the communications on the East Coast came through me, and I was in charge of making sure that it got to the right place on time. Uh, and the people were there, and they did a great job. But one of the victories I had there was uh, I had the ladies were getting pregnant like it was a common cold, and the room was closed. And so I said, "Well, look, we need to, this, this is not good. Let me take the, let me invite a, a pretty young nurse from the Norfolk Naval Hospital to come over and make sure they understand the mechanics of how this thing works." And nothing changed. They did that. I took a right day off. I said, "I don't even need to be in place." And so uh, nothing changed. And my secretary said, "A lot of the girls, ladies, don't think that that's they can do anything else." Because what we, they were working, we were in a high-tech environment, and their job was driving the jeep to deliver things or putting messages in the right slot and stuff like that. So I called my department heads together and said, by tomorrow morning, I need you to identify one job that you can teach somebody in your area that you can teach somebody how to do in one day. And so they did. I pulled those people out of the, some of those people out of those jobs and put some of those people who had career paths to do those functions. And once they did that, people started coming to work early, staying late, pregnancy rate went down, promotion rate went up. And so these were Women and minorities. Women and minorities. Women. Yeah. Okay. And that's where the, the lower ranking, the lower echelon jobs tended to be. Where um, other um, experiences of women in the military where you had to take charge or do something well, different. That was, my, yeah, think about it. that was my first experience with women in the military, and my second was probably at uh, Naval ROTC, Southern University. We didn't have any on the, at that time. We didn't have any women on the ships at all. So that shore station was my was really my first and probably primary experience. And so that I, I'm very pleased with that worked out. Mm. So what you just described was at that location, with the high pregnancy rate, but you that was at that, that was in Norfolk, uh, in Norfolk, Virginia, at the Naval Communication Station. Okay. Um, let's see where something else went through in mind, but uh, that was it. The uh, head duty at, at the Joint Chiefs of Staff, mm -hmm. and my job was to design and develop communication systems that could survive. A, a nuclear lay down on this country. And so that was, uh, and so when we were ha in the midst of the Cold War, my job was to say, was to develop communication systems that would be functional so we could direct our forces in spite of being attacked. So that was, that was a very interesting job. Uh, what did you do for fun when you were off duty? <laughs> Do, do I have to answer that question? <laughs> Not you you had fun. <laughs> <laughs> I had fun. Uh, one of the things that uh, I, I, I went out and had a good time, but uh, the things, one of the things I did, I always traveled alone. And uh, we'd go, I'd be at all the various functions and parties, but after a while I would disappear. Because sometimes folks have too much to drink, and I didn't want to be involved in that. So I would go out and do what, uh, and, and do what I would do independently. I'd go, uh, you know, I, and a lot of times I would, I would go rent a car, and most people would go to the dispensary rent a car, and I'd go places where nobody else would go. So, uh, what kind of places? Hmm? What kind of places? Well, I'd go to, if there was a, a, a beach, a hotel, a restaurant, uh, you just, when you when you come into port and you don't have any transportation, you're limited to where you can walk or a cab can take you. So if you do your homework, and, they, and the Navy had port guides, so you can say, oh, 20 miles away there's a so-and-so. So that sounds interesting. I want to go see that. Oh, oh, oh you make me. So I took a lot of pictures and stuff like that. Do you still so I can't have find these? it in there. I was like, do you have any of those? <laughs> I can't find it. <laughs> don't know where they are. Uh, where were you when the Vietnam War ended? I guess I was, uh, yeah, 
Depends on when you want to say it officially ended. Did it end before we cleared the mines from High Pond Harbor? Or did it end after? You know, we cleared the mines out of High Pond Harbor. I know it was over when we finished that. But did we stop the war? I guess it had to stop before we would agree to do that. So I guess I was in, uh, I was in uh, Norfolk, Virginia. And so that's when I, it goes back to the piece where we were directed to head, to head, head, head west. Um, how, do, how do you feel uh, witnessing casualties and destruction? Casualties? Where? Uh, during, um, like, with your uh, giving, providing support fire. Did you see any casualties or, like, what was it like seeing that destruction? We couldn't, I didn't see any casualties at all. In fact, we had to look through the binoculars to see land. And we keep in mind, our fire missions were 20 miles out. Mm -hmm. And so we, we were, we were, I was, even though they talked about Asian arms for, as a result of uh, being a cause for prostate cancer. And so I went to apply for my disability, and the question was, did you put a foot on, Viet on Vietnamese soil? The answer was no. Even though the vapors may have blown my way, uh, I didn't qualify. So I never, I never asked to set foot on, on Vietnam, no one. Uh, what kind of friendships uh, and camaraderie did you uh, form while serving? Few. Okay. Few. Very few. They were uh, friendly. Uh, friendships for the moment. Lasting friendships. Uh, and not really. Because what, this is my case. When I left the place, I never looked back. I'd leave. I wish everybody well. But then I'm gone. I, I, don't, I don't try to go back and visit, uh, see how they're doing. Once my responsibility is over, I draw. And, and, and that was probably more and more so, because people have a lawyer to you. And so I want to go back into somebody else's business where their people feel a lawyer. And I'm not going to do that. So I, I, I left, when I left, when you saw me leave, I was gone. For 30 years, how did you decide to retire or what? what? I was having so much fun, I would pay to do it. Uh, but they said, well, we got to cut down on the service size of the service and you old guys got to go. So I got, I got my letter to go and I was, uh, uh, I was having a great time. One of the things I didn't mention to you is that uh, I was assigned to the uh, National Science Foundation and we were conducting operations in Antarctica. And so we, we were doing uh, the experiments on ozone hole and global warming and searching out and, and, uh, Arctic life and, and that, it, all the things that you see going on, we were providing operational support for that. Mm -hmm. um, you wondering about the family? Oh yeah, Jane. Uh, so how did you actually return home? Return home, meaning? Uh, from at, from the, uh, the end of your service. Uh, my last duty station was in Washington, D.C., which was where I was born. And I called my detail up and said, I'm not going anywhere else other than Washington, D.C. So I had a very strong say in where I went and what I did. And so, uh, and you do your homework again, there is a document that lists all of the positions that you might be qualified for and when they become vacant. And he said, well, I'd like this job or this job or this one. So you, you, you don't have any authority to tell, but you can lobby for what you want. How were you received by your family once they knew that you were finally home for good? Great, there's no difference in my family. You know, my family, my family, they were, they were glad to see me home and they were, they were happy, to, they were proud to see what I was doing. And how were they while you were, those 30 years, where, where were they, or you know, when did you get married, and how did that well, my mother didn't, work with those 30 years of being on a ship? Uh, I, they, they welcomed me when I got back. Okay. I, didn't, I didn't perceive any, it was like I had uh, I, I never left. It was, uh, I came back, I came home I, whenever I could, uh, and uh, it wasn't a matter of, being, uh, even though gone a lot, he was still home a lot. Uh, the, my parents and family 
I had an opportunity to visit me in Italy. They never would have done that otherwise. They had an opportunity to visit me in California at grad school. They never would have done that otherwise. They probably would, they had an opportunity to visit me when I was stationed in Massachusetts. So for my family, it was an adventure for them too. They say, where are you going next? So and it's and it's. It's not, it's not a storybook kind of a thing. There was a lot of hard work along the way because uh, my philosophy, and so far so good, and I pass it on to my children, if you want to be successful, you have to under-promise, over-deliver. Under-promise, over-deliver. And they have, uh, they, have, they have bought into that, and uh, they don't, you know, they, they, they know that you get, you gotta. It's competitive. The other thing is that, uh, that I think that's really transferable is it takes as much skill to be evaluated as it does to evaluate somebody. And a lot of times we don't know how to receive an evaluation. If your boss tells you, uh, Robert, you got great potential. You know what that means? You ain't doing a thing now. That's what that means. Potential means <laughs> it's sitting up here, it's got potential energy, but it isn't doing anything. But you, <laughs> and so you need to understand that. And so I have been an advocate of writing your own evaluation. Now, how do you do that? In most organizations, you're, you're given a form to fill out, and you fill out the form, and you hope the boss writes you. No, you don't stop there. You go to the office. You get the five looks the smooth form, you type it out and write, have it ready for signature. Now, when you go in for your counseling session and you have written, uh, Robert walks on water and it was shoe, shoe bottoms don't even get down. And your boss changes it to knee deep. You don't confront him, but it him or her. You said, thank you so much for your candid evaluation. I would like to earn the water walking evaluation. What do I need to do in your eyesight to earn that? And, he, and the, the boss is obligated to tell you. And you said, thank you very much. Do you mind if I check with you periodically to, to see how I'm doing? And so he says, no problem. It's a good, I'll check with the secretary. It's once a month, okay. So you have really boxed him in. And so don't give me a number one evaluation 11 months and then going to surprise me on the 12th. Because I have just out documented you. And that's, that's worked very well. How did you readjust to civilian life? I didn't, I really didn't readjust. I, uh, I left the military, in fact, even before I left, I, uh, I went out to get, I was at the Science Foundation, went out to get lunch one day. It was raining, it was cold, and this guy, a vendor on the corner, was selling hot dogs and sodas and potato chips. And I said, here I am. Captain in the Navy, got a couple of degrees, a wealth of experience, but when's the last time I had anybody standing in front of my desk bringing me money? And so I said, okay, this is, so this, this whole thing of being an entrepreneur, uh, that's an exciting idea. I think I'll go into real estate. And so I did that, and I sold real estate for, for, for a number of years. I said, that work is too hard. And uh, then I, uh, went to become an emergency manager for James City County in uh, Virginia where we were uh, the same skills that we ran running operation centers in the military. You used to run an operation center that takes care of hurricanes, tornadoes, natural disasters and that, and that sort of thing and, and be able to automate that and bring that picture, the one single picture to, to the decision making was uh, a fun thing to do. Are you a part of any um, veterans organizations? American Legion, but I'm not really an active member of, of anything right now. I'm sorry, I mean, uh, just going back for a second. Uh, um, what year did you act? Did your service actually end? 1991. Okay. Uh, what are some life lessons you learned um, from the military? I learned that uh, the. There were more opportunities than I ever knew of. I learned that if you wanted something to happen, you had to make it happen. You couldn't passively wait for opportunity. 
you had to be willing to take charge. You had to be willing to uh, not follow the beaten path. Uh, not to be afraid to be innovative, but uh, you're not shooting crap. You're going out um, uh, with, with, uh, with knowledge and solid information. You may extrapolate a bit, and, but uh, but you, you've got to be willing to push the envelope to do it better than everybody else is, because your rating is your evaluation is competitive. If, uh, on board a ship, somebody's got to be the number one guy. Somebody, so you, you know, I think it's important to go in with the attitude that I'm the number one guy. You, you, only question is who's number two and three. Uh, how did the wartime experiences affect your life? Uh, not not, not very adverse at all. It, uh, it, you know, I, I, I'm a, I'm a, I was operating in technology, not 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 going out hurting people. And so uh, it, 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 it gave me a chance to push the envelope and do things uh, in that field. And before you move on, because I, I don't know that we are clear on communication mm -hmm. and kind of what that component is to a military operation. Well, if you can't tell your forces what to do, imagine you have somebody that needs to be somewhere to do something to coordinate, I'm going to do A, then you do B. If you can't, it's all wrapped up in what we call command and control. And so, uh, uh, so if the, if one component is going to go by land, the other one's going to come by air, and the other one needs to come by sea, it needs to be done in the right sequence, uh, that sort of thing. If the, in the case of the gunfire support mission, the sailor had, to, the, the soldier had to say, I need support. And this is where I needed, and we had to be precise in delivering it because it was coming. The shell was coming real close to him, and we didn't want to hurt him. We just wanted to put it where he wanted to keep people from hurt from hurting him. And so the the, the uh, that's the, that is integral to command and control, to telling your forces where to be, or or in the civilian environment, telling the components of your organization what you want done. How has um, military service affected your views on war, or just the military in general? Uh, nobody. I don't. I'm not an. Af I'm not a. I'm not a warmonger or anything like that. The thing that I see that you take away with the people I've seen never go back home as the same person they left. Their experiences were and horizons were broadened, and I say you can't. And, and, and college education is great. I encourage everybody to get one of them. But uh, it's it's a total difference when you at 21 years old, you've just finished college and you're in charge of people older than your parents and, and numbers of them. Uh, your civilian counterpart is going to work and he's got a specific job in a cubby hole. You've got an area of responsibility uh, and you make things happen. One of my bosses on one of the ship, the Inchon, he came, I was having some technical difficulty one night. He says, well, Mr. Bobo, I'm glad to see you, you know, here, here with your people making things. He said, I don't expect you to, to do the work, but I expect you to make sure it gets done. And that's, and that's one of the major differences, is uh, you work through other people. Uh, what message would you leave for future generations that are going to hear and see this interview? I would say don't discount the uh, don't discount the military, the uh, the Naval Academy, the Air Force Academy, West Point, Coast Guard Academy. Some of the probably not some of the finest institutions in this country. People are lined up to get in. Unfortunately, they don't have enough black folks in line. Um, well, I feel like we've come to the end. Is there anything that you'd like to discuss that we haven't already asked you? Well, the, uh, in spite of all of the privileges that I've had to have the experience that I've had, uh, by far the most meaningful one was my experience at Southern University assisting young people to make some positive decisions. Uh, so you, could, uh, you got a chance to go to places in Louisiana that I'd never heard of. Uh, you have. You set up a, 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 a display table, a recruitment table, and on one side, on one side of the room, the recruiter said, "Join the military, and we'll pay for your college education after two years." I said, "Join the military, join, come to college. I'll pay for it right now." 
So that, and, and they didn't know that. And, and the recruiting is a, a sales game. I didn't know that either, but I had a friend of mine who was a recruiter, and he said, uh, Bo, a salesman is like, a, a, a salesman can sell a person with one cow, two milking machines, and take the cow back as collateral. And so based upon that experience that uh, he gave me, I now started to learn how to do this, because I'd never had to recruit before, and, and that wasn't my job, but that's what was necessary to do in order to reach out and, uh, and, 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 get, and expose the opportunity to young people. Uh, my last question, uh, what would you like, what's the message that you'd like to uh, give to other veterans? Uh, be a part of your community, do something, take your experience to uh, uh, share it with young people. Uh, some of it's good, some of it may not be so good. We've had a variety of experiences. Uh, but uh, the main thing, the thing I said earlier, you're not the same person that you were when you left home. The world is much bigger than you thought it was when you when you come out of high school. And uh, get, expose yourself, give it a try. It's, uh, you don't want nobody to get hurt, but uh, mm -hmm. you, you get hurt crossing the street. Mm -hmm. um, I think from a management standpoint, and what I've heard you know, listening to your uh, experiences and very impressed by them, that you have commanded a skill for, like, so you have to get the work done through other people. And, and so what, would, what characteristics would you say you possess to be able to to do that, number one. And then two, I've also heard you, a, a lot of things you said you learned in the military are transferable skills mm -hmm. out here in the real world. Oh, one experience I had, I was in grad school, and you know, ships are made out of metal and they rust. And you pick, somebody's got it's a dirty job shipping the paint off the ship and putting paint on it. And normally they get people doing this from, they start early in the morning and they work late in the evening. They start early in the morning. But yet and still, you with that work can only be done in ports. You got a finite number of days in port. You have certain expectations that you get so much done. So I told my people one day, I said, look, this is the work that we have to get done. I expect this much done on day one, this much done on day two, and so forth. So when that is done, you can take the rest of the day off. So the first day they came to me around noon and said, boss, we're finished. I said, well, let's go look and see how we've done. I said, this, no, this, 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 this won't cut it, this is that other part. So that day they came back to me later, I said, that's still that's a good improvement. We st we're still not there yet. They worked late that day, later than they would ordinarily. On Tuesday, they came back to me at noon again. I said, this is much better than it was uh, the last time, uh, but we still need to go back and touch this up a little bit more. Uh, on Wednesday, they came back to me at noon, and I said, hey, you, you're right on target, I said, we'll see you tomorrow. On Thursday, I'm looking for him at noon, and I didn't see him. And so they finished Thursday and Friday's work. I said, I'll see you on Monday. And so I got called in. He said, your people are taking off early. It's because they're doing the work. And so it's, you, you, you saw the, there's a, a difference between leadership and management. And so you, 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 put, you, you put those together. Like, I, knew, I would tell the senior enlisted guys, that this is what we got to do. Y'all make, you all make up the schedule. So if it's a matter of standing undesirable watches, somebody got to do it. But if, I said, hey, you make up your own schedule. You, you cover all the bases. I have no reason not to approve it. So it ain't my schedule, it's your schedule. And so, so you get people involved in making their own decisions but you hold them to high standards. And, uh, and they buy into, they like being the best at what they do. They had, uh, in the military, they have a com competition among ships and communications. And if you're the top guy, you earn the green sea. Well, my people thought they owned it. They expected to get it. We worked to do it. We, uh, we did it uh, better and faster than anybody else. And that's because of the pride they took in what they did. I don't, I don't know if that answered your question, but... The, no, it doesn't. Yeah. It does. um, 
Do you recall any of your awards and medals? I, I really don't want to even try to guess it though. I got, I got, I got a bunch, but I, I, uh, I, 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 I can't remember. So, There's so many. Not extraordinary. Man. Of course, you had medals of ultra being in Vietnam. You got, uh, uh, I can't remember the name. I guess one of the things that happened when I got out of the military, I was out of the military. I never uh, continued to try to live that military life. Uh, I'm a civilian and I'm going to be the best civilian I could be. And so, uh, so when I moved into real estate, I tried to be the best real estate agent I could be. When I moved into the uh, uh, emergency management, I, I, I didn't have any competition there. So I, was, I, I expect, I'm still trying to over deliver. So I, you know, when I left the military, I left the military. Gotcha, gotcha. Well, um, if you think of them, you know, or maybe Robert can follow up with you and maybe yeah, about, we, can get a, we can get a list of them. Well, I, I appreciate you all taking the time out to, to talk to me. And, Appreciate this has been a pleasure. Yeah, we really appreciate it. I'd say to young people, don't 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 write this off. This is a this is a good deal. This is the one they don't tell you about in high school. This is the one when you go down to see your local recruiter, he he will enlist you if you let he let him. I call it the equivalent to go. You want to buy a Mercedes. And you go to the Chevrolet dealer, what do you think he's going to sell you? <laughs> he doesn't get any credit for selling Mercedes, just as the enlisted recruiter does not get any credit for providing you with the officer opportunity. So you need to figure out what you want, uh, figure out how to get it. And, uh, and it's not for everybody, but uh, if you're willing to uh, work, you can do it. And I guess the other thing I need to mention, mm -hmm. the Navy requires that 80% plus, that's the number that I recall, of their officers be engineers or having completed engineering physics and, and math. So if you want to major in modern dance, if you're smart enough to do engineering physics and calculus, uh, that, that's fine, you won't. Mm -hmm. No restriction on, on your major, but when you operate, when you when you're operating at sea and ain't no, nobody else is mailing the thing back off to the fix, you need to understand, have be capable of understanding the technology that's presented to you. So, it's, I, I love it. I, I wish I could have gotten my son to do it. Okay. And, I, and last thing is, we're here for your, mm -hmm. this is family reunion? Yes, we're here for the, we can do So, you're here for the family reunion. Yes. And, you know, throughout, you talked about how important family is. So, what brings you to, what makes you come and participate in the family reunion? Well, I, I think family is important in, uh, in that you've got a lot of resources that are untapped. And I'm not talking about financial resources, I'm talking about experience, experience, experience resources. Uh, uh, what's the value of uh, getting an education? Not necessarily a college education, but if you stop at high school, you, uh, you have just relegated yourself to the, low income, the lowest income bracket in America. So, you, uh, so if you're making, if you, as a parent, you make you allow your child to make those decisions, and then expect you to foot the bill. Uh, that's that's not the right thing to do. So you need to insist that uh, your child make smart decisions, and uh, even to their discomfort. In my house, you will go to you will go to the school. A friend of mine says, "You're out of my house at 18. You then got to go into college. I got your back. You're in the military, and they gonna pay you, or you got your own job, and you." And, and, in your own place. But in 17, he buys my suitcase. So they need to know that the child needs to stand on their own two feet. And I, the example I use, there's nothing more pathetic than an eagle that can't fly. So we need to teach our children to fly. As uh, one of our black admirals says, he's gone, and Admiral Ben Hackett, he says, he got into aviation and never been in an airplane. He says, I command you to fly. And that's what, that's, what, that's, that's, that's the kind of spirit I think we need to instill in our young people. We're you're good. Here, you're here we're to do good. that. We're better than the rest of them. I can compete. I expect to finish first. As my high school principal said when we were before integration, we expect you to bring home the bacon wherever you compete. And we did. Yeah.
Anyhow, they, don't get me started. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you again for your wonderful interview. Thank you. Enjoyed meeting you and hearing your stories. Thank and we'll you. Protect them and get you a copy. We're going to do the best we can. Thank yeah. you. Yeah. All right. Thank you.